I've always known that I wanted to make art. Ever since I could draw and realized that that was a, an actual career, that you could get paid to, to make art and you could live that way. Um, I, I've always known that and I went to art college thinking that I was on my path to becoming just a, a classic traditional painter. But a lot of the art that I was making was, it was very narrative based. Uh, and I was storytelling with single images. Uh, and at one point I came up with an idea for what I thought was going to be three or four images that were a series of paintings telling the parts of a story. And it occurred to me that this, it would work better as a book. And so I, I started looking back at all the picture books I'd enjoyed when I was a kid. And just, I, I, I realized that there, there was a very, it was a wonderful device for, for storytelling, just the, 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 the physical object of the book. And so I took this idea for a couple of paintings, translated it into the form of a book, and that was my first picture book, How to Catch a Star. Uh, and once I made the transition that one time, it was very easy after that to just think like that. Everywhere and anywhere. Uh, you never know when you're gonna get an idea, and often big ideas come from the clashing together of two smaller ideas. So I always keep a notepad and a pencil. Uh, and it's not like you sit down with a blank sheet of paper and say, okay, I'm going to have an idea now. It doesn't work like that. Uh, but it's, you know, real artists, good artists show up every day and they, they work and some things work and some things don't and you, you work your, your way through things. But real moments of inspiration come from surprising things. Um, the the, the idea for stuck came from a real life event where I actually got a kite stuck in a tree. Uh, but then I, but I didn't unlock the, 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 the story. I came up with the beginning in the middle of that story. I didn't know how to end it. And I, so I set it to the side for several months and I was watching my nephews play with toys and they were playing in this really elaborate game and then they heard something outside and they just ran away and completely forgot about the toys. And I was like, oh yeah, things don't have to just end. Sometimes you just move on to the next thing. And that gave me the idea for the ending. Um, and then with the, for, for the Fate of Fausto, for example, that I don't know, really know where the idea for that came from. I was uh, in the north coast of Northern Ireland and I was just, I was watching this storm come over the, the Irish Sea with the Irish Sea and the Atlantic meet. And just the, the, the sense of scale uh, was very, very powerful. And that the story came out of nowhere and I took out my, uh, my notebook and, and, and I wrote it down and the, it really hasn't changed very much since then. So that's, it's, it's something that was channeled through me more than anything else. So the ideas come from everywhere. What's a good story? Well, there's a very fine line between satisfaction and predictability. People try to be unpredictable, but by being unpredictable, you can sometimes be unsatisfying. Sure, you can come up with a twist in the story that nobody's expecting, but it also might just leave people cold. So for a good story, honestly, I think has a, a good beginning, a good middle and a good end. And it's that simple. You set up your, your you, you, you introduce your world or your characters, your platform, you set up the, uh, some sort of issue and then you resolve it. If you're thinking that the story is separate from the pictures and that it's not. Um, you know, if you have an idea and you think yourself in your head, is that idea taking its form in words or in pictures? It's probably neither. It's a feeling. It's, it's somewhere in between them. And that's exactly the way it is for, a, for a, a book idea. Then you have to put it through the means that you have at your disposal to, to put it out in the world. And that's when it has to go through the, the picture or the word filters. And it's then you start to work things out. But the, the, I think the good essence of an idea for stories happens somewhere pre-picture and pre-word. And then you just start to figure out what it looks like and what it sounds like. Whatever material I use tends to lend itself to the, the, the story. Um, and honestly, it's, I don't put a lot of thought into it. It's just whatever feels right. So Stuck was made digitally partly because of circumstances at the time. I was in between studios and didn't have a lot of room to work. Um, the Here We Are was made in an awful lot of detail because it felt like it was a reference science book. Uh, and uh, sometimes I've used just watercolor because it feels like a, if there's a lot of you know, nature or sky or ocean in a, in a book, it, it just feels right and natural to, to use those things without really th overly thinking it. And so with Fausto, I, I wanted to use 
an art making technique that honored the traditional way books were made because it felt like an old story. So that's why I chose lithography. It's only happened right. twice. Well, no, Child of Books was that, I don't think that I illustrated somebody else's story. Sam and I both well, wrote yeah, that wrote story together. and we both illustrated yeah. it. That was a weird art collaboration. The other one's Imaginary Fred, the, the one yeah. with Owen Colford. That's the only, the only two, Crayons and Fred. Well, Crayons, I, I was tricked into looking at the, at the manuscript. Uh, and it was such a simple, clean concept, and I could see immediately how it should be done. And I already started to, to feel annoyed that if I didn't do it, somebody else would do it and they would do it wrong. So I agreed to do it and, and I was given the opportunity to help shape the story an awful lot. And, uh, and I enjoyed it and then that took off and had a life of its own. And with Imaginary Fred, Owen Colfer and I, we met at a book festival in Australia. And we just really, really got along very well. We had a similar sense of, of humor, and, and he said that he would like to work with me at some point. And, and I was like, okay, that could be interesting. Uh, sort of thinking that, you know, two or three years down the line, he'd come up with an idea. But two weeks later, he goes, I came up with this with you in mind, and he, and he let me read it. And you know, at that point, I couldn't really back out of it. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but I, I really, really, really enjoyed the story. So I, I, went, I went with it. <laughs> Really, I wasn't much of a book person when when I was growing up. Um, I, I, you know, I was climbing trees and digging holes and playing football. And uh, but I, I, somebody pointed out that I grew up with three brothers and, and a very busy household, and my books are always quite sparse and empty. I was like, maybe that's that was me longing for some space and isolation. <laughs> Well, so there, I have a whole separate career as a fine artist and the art there it tends to be very much about trying to understand the way that our world works and um, the, the pictures are, they're conceptual, but they're figurative at the same time and I, the more and more the art and the books are getting closer and closer together because I used to try and keep them quite separate because it confused people, but more and more I, I care less and I'm just covering so much of the same, of the same topics, but the, the art becomes slightly uh, slightly more abstract in terms of it doesn't have a very clear beginning, middle and end of a story, but it's still question asking and storytelling and, and a lot of it is dealing with uh, the way in which humans understand our world, like the, looking at the, the, the how we make sense of the night sky, how we uh, make sense of our own oceans, uh, how we remember the stories that we're told uh, in different ways from each other. Um, so the the style, I think, people would recognize the color choices a lot between them, but I think that the style in my oil painting makes sense to be a little more figurative than, than the books. So I paint these portraits of people that I know fully, but I never photograph them. And uh, then I invite a small number of people to come along and, and as part of a performance uh, to witness the full portrait. And then nobody takes a photograph they then observe this painting being submerged um, as part of this ritualistic experience. Afterwards, I get people to speak on camera about what they remember seeing, and then I follow up with them months, years later to see what they still remember. So it's all about memory and identity and storytelling and loss. That's a whole, that's a whole uh, five year, uh, seven year project now. That's not, I'm still only, you know, two thirds of the way through. Um, but that's a very conceptual project and it's, it's about testing memory and identity. And... No. No. Eyewitness testimony, as, as far as the you know, police and, and fire departments and medical services are concerned, is, is wildly unreliable. Because people tend to focus, the thing they're focusing on gets blown out of proportion and everything else drops away. It's like a fisheye lens over something, so it's, you know, people convince themselves that they've seen something and then they're, they're, they, then they've seen it. So, yeah, the human memory is a very malleable thing. It did, yes. I think the fatherhood sort of forced me to absolutely address head on how I feel about things and a way in which I would be willing and prepared to speak about that. <clears throat> uh, it's, it changed the, the, the schedule of, that I keep because obviously I can't work nights and weekends really anymore. Um, but it, I think it just, it, it forced me to be more direct and cut to the core of what it is that I believe in and, and what it is that I want to say. I don't know, it's a guttural feeling. I grew up in, in Belfast, which is you know a large port town. It's a, one of the biggest shipbuilders 
Uh, and then on the north coast of Ireland, is it's a very turbulent sea. It's where the, the North Sea, the Atlantic, and the Irish Sea all meet. So it and it seemed impossibly large. Um, and it's just this the the notion of how powerful it is and how little we really understand it has always been very appealing to me. And then I wrote the storm, and I, I it was one of those stories that sort of told itself without me realizing what it was about. And and looking backwards on it now, I kind of I see that it was. It is about arrogance and greed and, and the, the, the steady march of progress and the consequences that that, that has. And something else I've realized that came in that was always there, but I, I've only realized was there, is this, this idea of climate change and man's relationship with nature. Um, that somehow we've always managed to convince ourselves that humanity is separate from above and, and dominant of nature when it's, it's the other way around. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of awakening to the, the impacts that our kind of very indulgent lives have had for the last several generations and the consequences that they actually reap. Uh, and, and things are starting to, to shift and change. But the, it's the notion that we can fix this is, is maybe the wrong thing. And, you know, it's like the, we're going to save the planet is maybe the wrong thing because the planet will be around afterwards. It, it's indifferent to us. It's it's life. It's our lives. That, it's ourselves that we have to, to save. And so there's a lot of that is in is in the, the elements of the book and the the lack of understanding, sort of, you know, the, the, the marching forward without even attempting to understand. I mean, that says it all. It's this, this idea of we always need more and more and more and more. And to what end? you know, to, to whose benefit. And, and even if, you know, there's a lot of people who deny that, that climate change is happening and, and the, I think they're idiots, but you, surely you could go back to those people and, and just say, it was like, well, even if you're not going to admit that it's real, you do have to admit that the system needs to be readdressed because it's massively unfair. I think I was fortunate enough to be brought up in a, in a very healthy environment where uh, humility and respect and consideration and tolerance were very key components of our lives. So, you know, think about the consequences of your actions rather than just take and... and I was never raised to, to think that I was better than anybody else. So I don't, I don't think I've ever had much trouble of... I don't think I've ever kidded myself that I was a Fausto, but I think it's in society in general, we're like a herd of buffalo. We're all running off the edge of a cliff and then, oh, everybody's doing it because everybody else is doing it. <laughs> well, there, there is a slight nod to, you know, the classic Faust, but yeah. the, what put that in my head in the first place is as I was uh, starting to tell the, the story, because the, the original version, it was just the man, um, and I needed a character name. We were getting our air conditioning unit fixed in Brooklyn, and the guy who came in to fix it was called Fausto. I was just like, that's <laughs> perfect. Yeah. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think he knows that that's why I named the book huh? I've never seen him since, but, it's mm -hmm. but also I wanted it to keep it in, in pairing with the EDM uh, version because you know the art was all made in, in Paris. Uh, I discovered this wonderful place through JR because uh, JR and I had made a print there together five years ago. Um, and it was just one image, and so we were there and we were working on it, and it was a fascinating process. And what I knew that I wanted to make the book using old techniques, uh, I thought of etching, I thought of screen printing, I thought of lithograph, and I, um, I was in Paris because I had just done that collaboration with Veja Shoes, and so I was there working on on the a project with them, and I, uh, my friend Charlotte uh, was Charlotte Le Bon was doing this uh, an internship or a residency there. Uh, so I, I went around to, to meet with her and just like, because it would be five years previous since I'd been there. And, and I met Amai and I, I remembered Patrice and I started asking him some questions about what's it like to do not just one image, but a book. Uh, and I showed Patrice the story and he really fell in love with the, the idea of the story. It felt very, it was a very powerful thing and, and then made me an offer that he would help me and provide the full opportunity to, to make the book if we could do something with them. And so I made a... a all the original prints that came off the machine, there was only 100. We made a limited edition book that, that threw them. I wanted the book to feel like it was the kind of book that you could have picked up 100 years ago. 
Uh, so the, the and, and classic picture books, as you know them, were you know it's a fairly new phenomenon. And so this this is paying tribute to some of those more uh, historically classic books that that were storybooks for children from from way 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 back in the day. And you know that's why uh, we worked to get specific uh, bespoke marbled paper done for the end pages and. Uh, I work with a, a typographer, David Pearson. To uh, he he hand set the type so that uh, it's a font that's never been digitized. There's actually there's a really interesting story. It's a it's a French font from uh, the 1940s um, that he had collected and he's he's owned for I don't know 30 years or something. And and uh, and so he hand set it, uh, which is why it's it's all slightly imperfect. Uh, so as the whole book was made using really traditional techniques. And and it was that there's there's a poeticism and a rhythm to the book when you read it aloud that I and I I wanted to take those opportunities to play with the the book as a device so that people did pause and and stop and and you draw at moments and you know there's one spread where there's just one word on the page because the reality is that they're not all happy stories you know the it's it's like it's it will be almost then forgiving this this indulgent patriarchal consumerist world that we've, we've been enjoying for, for a long time is like, the, there is no happy ending to that. It's that things need to be addressed or, or, or perish. No, absolutely not. It was, it was before that, it was before he even uh, announced that he was running. And, that, and I put the note in the, the book in America to say that the story was written in 2015 because I didn't want people to make the obvious ah, connection. Okay. I don't think he deserves the connection. And weirdly, he's become... It, the, the character was, was created as a, you know, a, a caricature of white patriarchal uh, elitism. And he has since turned into the absolute personification of that parody. Um, but no, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not about him at all. Somebody pointed out, I was like, oh, these are the same things in the, in the Little Prince. And I was like, oh, yeah. And I was like, I wonder if I should change them for that reason. And, and I said it not to because there was an honesty. And I was in my dad's car and I pulled off to the side of the road in, in, uh, in Carnlock, up by the north coast of, of Antrim. When I was writing the story, there was an urgency and an immediacy to it. And they were literally the things that I saw around me. So it was the sheep in the field, there was a wildflower right there, there was a tree, there was a forest, there was a field, the sea and the mountain, and, and I was like, well, I, I can't... I, it, would, I, it, it, it would have felt disingenuous to change it for the, for the sake of a comparison. Uh, I, my French is absolutely appalling. Maybe after a bottle of wine it would improve a little bit. <laughs> but, but, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, uh, when, I, when I'm in France I tend to... It, it improves a little bit, and we were we were just in, in Spain for a little bit, and I kept speaking to people in French. So it's like a, uh, I'm a product of the British education system, and unfortunately, there there was an arrogance there that they thought speaking a foreign language means speaking English louder. Uh, so I, I did. I wish that I, I spoke French, but I don't.